Hey everyone, welcome to All Things Evangelism podcast. I'm here today with my guest Joseph Scaff, pastor and church planter from Seeds Church Plant Newcastle, which has just merged with the Warner's Bay Seventh Day Adventist Church. So he's also the pastor there. Welcome uh, to the podcast, Joseph. Thank you very much, Matt. It's such a privilege to be here and to be producing this podcast with you. And I hope that all of our listeners uh, can get a blessing from it. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, so today's a really exciting topic. We're going to be talking about uh, the disciples of Jesus and how they were ordinary men, but turned out to be extraordinary disciples. So they were very human. They had very real challenges, you know, certain personalities, certain um, liabilities that they carried. Uh, mm. Yet still, Jesus was able to make them the foundational you know, stones that he built the church on. So uh, Matthew, uh, James, John, Bartholomew, Thomas, uh, Judas, uh, all the rest. These were just ordinary tradespeople for the most part. Um, do you find, Joseph, any significance in the fact that Jesus, when he chooses his 12 apostles, uh, chooses tradesmen? You know, that is such a great question, Matt, because it, it, that's indeed a fact. I mean, Jesus didn't call, as far as I'm concerned, anyone who was already in the priestly sort of a career. Um, you know, not, not even actually John the Baptist, which, which God uh, had called to be the forerunner of the Messiah, whose parents were priests, and therefore he was expected to be a priest, was actually a priest. So I do find it quite fascinating that Jesus uh, chose Tradis uh, to be a part of, of this first generation of apostles, of church planters. And, and that's nothing necessarily wrong, but I think that Jesus had a statement there that uh, he himself being a carpenter uh, by trade, I think that the, the point here that Jesus is saying is that uh, I think that in our human minds, it's very easy for us to think that somehow the clergy or the priesthood have some kind of monopoly on being representatives of God. Uh, and that certainly was the case back on those days uh, that where they were almost exclusively seen as the only authorized people to preach, uh, to, to communicate about God. And Jesus really uh, turns that upside down when he calls unlearned men, men who were not initiated in this, you know, in the studies of the rabbis where, you know, the, the, the children uh, that were training to become rabbis or to become priests or scribes, you know, they were, um, part of their training was to actually memorize the whole Torah, mm -hmm. uh, the whole book of all the prophets, you know, all of the Old Testament, pretty much by the age of 18. And, and here they are and Jesus is calling them. And I think that the message here is that, you know, Jesus is calling ordinary men and women because he is an extraordinary God with an extraordinary call. And the only thing that he needs is a willing heart, a heart that is uh, converted, destitute of uh, pride, uh, at least an excess of pride because we, we are all pride in one way or the other. But people that have seen in God's character such a such a, an amazing, a compelling character, such uh, as the most beautiful, most important thing in this world. And, and if they can just see God for who he is like that, I think that God can work uh, through whoever it is, you know, from tradies to children to elderly alike. And, and that's the power. The power is not in the, those who are called, but in the one who's calling. Mm. Yeah, that's true. You know, you're making me think of First uh, Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27 where the apostle Paul says, not many wise after the flesh are called. Right? And then he goes into that whole statement of, you know, not many mighty, uh, not many strong. And then God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And he doesn't want anyone to glory in his presence, like, because they're so amazing. They're so wonderful. This morning I was reading hmm. also in Deuteronomy chapter nine, and God says to the Israelite people, he said, it's a, it's one of the coolest chapters. Mm. Sorry, sorry, not chapter nine. It was chapter eight. Mm. And he basically says in the first 10 verses to Israel, I allowed you to go through what you had to go through in the wilderness to mm. prepare you for the promised land. So you went through a land that was empty and barren and mm. that forced you to suffer 
deprivation. And all that discipline, all that challenge, all that difficulty was a test for me to prove you, to discipline you. And it would prepare you for inheriting the promised land. And then he says, and don't think when you get into the promised land that I, that I dispossess the people that used to inhabit the promised land because you're so righteous. Mm-hmm, mm. Because you were so righteous. I did it because they were so terrible. That's what basically God says. Yes. So I'm just putting these texts together in 1 Corinthians one twenty seven. And onward, God's saying, not many wise after the flesh are called. And then back in Israelite times, when he delivered them from Egypt, he says, listen, don't think that I called you because you were righteous after the flesh. Like, it wasn't because you were so holy or so great or or so much better than other people. And then even before chapter 8, I don't know what chapter it's in, because I'm studying in my personal devotions, Yeah, book of Deuteronomy. And one other instance Mm. prior to chapter 8, he says, um, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest among the nations. I chose you because you mm. were the least. You were the least in number. You were just not a very reputable, strong people. Um, so I chose you because you were the weakest. And if God chooses tradesmen to change the world, then everyone knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that it was God who changed the world because those men had nothing in themselves that would uh, – advance the idea that it was them, their skill, their talent, their ability that changed the world. And God is glorified then. Mm. But if, if he goes, if Jesus goes through the intelligentsia, if he goes through the anointed academics, well, then many people could just suppose, well, yeah, you know, they changed the world. You know, it was their power, their brilliance, their magnificence that that affected the change so yeah that's interesting so dude Hmm. i'm wondering just just a thought have you ever considered the fact that jesus chose 12 rather than 10 or 11 or 7 or 16 like is there anything to the number 12 in your estimation well that that is a great question matt one of one of the things that i learned recently is particularly on the book of Matthew that is um, that is uh, easier to be seen. The book of Matthew is actually structured uh, to be a re-reading of the whole story of Israel through the Old Testament, through new lenses in Jesus. So for example, uh, you start the book of Matthew with a genealogy and which brings us you know, to the book of Genesis. You know, the Genesis, here is the Genesis, or here is the genealogy of the heavens and the earth, and here is the genealogy of Adam and his family and Abraham. But then he he, he tells, you know, the, the genealogy of Jesus, who's supposed to be our new Adam. But another interesting thing is that also when we when we go to the last chapter, actually the last paragraph of the book of Matthew, we see uh, an echo of the last chapter, the last paragraph of the Jewish Bible as well. So the, do you know which was the, which, which in the because you know that the uh, in our current Protestant Bibles, uh, even though it's the same Bible, the order of the books is in a different order than the Jewish Bible. Yeah. So um, so in the Jewish Bible, the last book uh, of the Jewish Bible is actually Second Chronicles. Mm-hmm. And when we go to Second Chronicles, we actually see uh, the Messiah, the other Messiah, because there's only there's like two Messiahs, primarily, of course, Jesus, but the second Cyrus, uh, the Persian king, is also referred to as my Messiah by God through the prophet Isaiah. And we see Cyrus saying to people, arise and go. You know, go to I all authority has been given to me by God, and therefore you oh Jews, go to Jerusalem to rebuild your nation. So in, in very similar, because Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, therefore go, not this time to Jerusalem to rebuild, but to the whole world to build a spiritual nation uh, mm-hmm. for God. So when we look into this, this framework, we see all the time that um, uh, Matthew wants us to realize that everything that God has been doing in the Old Testament was somehow pointing to Jesus. So we see the element Jesus as a second Adam through the genealogies. We see, for example, that uh, Israel is the new Egypt. When, when Herod is uh, a commands to slay the babies in the same way that Pharaoh commanded to slay uh, the babies. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so we see, uh, so also Jesus as a new Moses many times, you know, him delivering uh, the speeches and delivering the law to people. But one of the things that we see is that Jesus calls 12 disciples in the same way that God had called 12 tribes. Uh, 
So in a way, these this new these disciples who are going to be the new patriarchs uh, or the new um, heads of, of, the, of God's family, in, I think in my reading of, of the Gospel of Mark, basically Mark is saying, you know, whatever was with Israel in the Old Testament, Jesus is inaugurating a new Israel, mm-hmm. also headed by 12 patriarchs, in that case, the apostles. Yeah. So the church is now the Israel. The church is now this chosen people of God who are uh, commissioned to be witnesses to God, um, you know, to the rest of the world and to bring the, the blessings there. That's well. really powerful. Like I've, I've heard a sermon on this before where, yeah, some of those things that you were mentioning were brought out of the text of the book of Matthew. And yeah, like, and th- this, this one thought kind of precipitate, basically the first thing that this sermon talked about was that Israel originally was a name given to one man who had attained a spiritual victory with God. So that's the genesis of the name, right? Like it comes from the fact that Jacob wrestled with God, won a spiritual victory And then now he has the title of Israel. And then that title is transferred to all of his descendants physically. Mm. And then he said, you know, Jesus is is one man who he's the Christ, he's the anointed, and he obtains spiritual victory. And then his spiritual victory then is now transferred. It's transferred to all of his followers, his spiritual descendants. And then he talks about Matthew and how, in chapter 121, it says his name will be called Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And um, so he's, he's, that's a reference to the Old Testament, Joshua, who delivers the Israelites out of, uh, or into the promised land. And then in chapter two, the story, as you mentioned, of Herod trying to kill all the babies because he had heard the king was born and he wanted to kill Jesus. And then that forces Joseph to go into Egypt and Joseph goes into Egypt because he had a dream. Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus. Yes, yes. To Egypt because he had a dream. Um, and then he, once Herod dies, he comes out of Egypt. And uh, then the vo- verse in Matthew 2 that's quoted is from Hosea. And chapter 11 and verse 1, which said, I have called my son out of Egypt. And then Matthew applies that verse, which originally referred to Israel, to Jesus. And so a man named Joseph in the Old Testament who had dreams went into Egypt Mm. and Israel, the nation came out of Egypt and God said, that's my son. Israel, the nation is my son. And I brought him out. And in the book of Matthew, a man named Joseph has dreams, the stepfather of Jesus. He goes into Egypt and then comes out of Egypt. Um, And then Matthew quotes Hosea 11, which originally applied to the nation of Israel and he applies it to Jesus. Yes. Obviously saying Jesus is following the footsteps. He's succeeding where Israel failed. And then, and then it's like he gets baptized. And after, you know, the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were baptized through the Red Sea experience. And so, yeah, so Matthew's following along the lines of the history of Israel. And Jesus is succeeding where Israel failed because he's the new Israel. Yes. Which is this new 12, a second 12. And so it's funny, hey, because, yeah, this is really powerful. I think it's evident. And it's clear from scripture that Jesus was, that he called 12. He called 12 on purpose. It wasn't just incidental. And he knew he was the, he was the real Israel. And he's the true, in the truest sense, the son of God, as it says in John 15, you know, in verse one, I am the true vine. Yeah. The original vine was Israel, you know? um, So he's the real thing. And Israel was just, kind of as a nation, a symbolic representation of the future Christ to come. And he succeeds where Israel fails and he chooses these 12 disciples. And these 12 disciples are average people. Yes. I want to, I want to talk about their averageness. If we can. Yeah, go ahead. Let's talk about it, but you just unlocked something my brain met because you know, Jesus is the new Israel in two senses. One sense, Jesus, is the new Israel as being the fulfillment of God's son, like the nation, you know, Jesus, you know, God in the old Testament calls Israel, Hey, they are my firstborn son. Yeah. So Jesus, is the new Israel as a new nation. And, you know, however, Jesus is also the new Israel in the sense that he's kind of the new Jacob mm-hmm. in that he was the man who actually gave birth to 12 
men who would actually be the patriarchs of the nation of Israel. Yep. Now, look at this. Jacob had 12, 12 sons. And the 12 sons, I think that we, we, can, we could argue that his family was uh, a little bit dysfunctional, if you want. Yeah. Yeah, they were right. ordinary men. You know, they had all kinds of issues, you know, uh, from uh, excess of anger, you know, and deciding to kill a whole tribe of people because of a sexual sin that they committed against their one of their daughter, or one of their uh, uh, sorry, their um, uh, sister Dinah. Uh, we we have you know the episodes where the brothers hated Joseph so much that they decided to you know first maybe kill him and then sell him and so on. However, at the end of the story, these men changed remarkably especially Judah and their character changed and from being self-righteous people they actually became self-sacrifice self-sacrificing people to the point that Judah was also um you know willing to give his life for the sake of his brother Benjamin so what i look into that is that it is the same with the disciples so the disciples of Jesus they you know um they were also human beings with flaws like you and me they had their their character defects however after spending uh, seasons with Jesus and being molded by the Holy Spirit, they became spiritual giants. They became people that were willing to lay down their lives to preach the gospel. So, mm -hmm. you know, so, and I think that for us, you know, what, what it means is that if we can see ourselves as ordinary people as well, just like the sons of Jacob or just like, you know, the disciples, uh, what I think the Bible is promising us is that if we are walking with Jesus, his influence will, will uh, in us will be such that our characters will be transformed, that our innermost being will be transformed and that we'll become molded like Jesus. We will, be, we will have the same Holy Spirit, the same spirit of self-sacrificial uh, love that um, that Jesus manifested, it's going to be ours as well. So, just wanted to to kind of a, to to notice that uh, to our listeners, because sometimes we look at Peter and James and John in the Book of Acts and say, "Wow, these guys were so above and beyond what I am now." And the reality is, it's nothing on their own. It was what Jesus did for them. And if Jesus had done that for them, well, Jesus is also powerful and able, I imagine, to do that with us as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was necessary for Jesus to choose ordinary people to be his 12 ordinary men to be his 12 disciples, because had he chosen high level priests or just priests in general, then the average person would not believe that they could be taught of God. Yeah, they could be molded of God that that class distinction that that separates the average ordinary person from you know the anointed would remain and um yeah hey so that's just a side point but let's talk about some of the issues of the disciples mm. my mind immediately goes to matthew 17 where jesus is transfigured and yeah james john and peter are there and they get to see jesus transfigured and they get to see Elijah and Moses having a conversation with Christ. Mm. After that glory subsides and the scene goes back to normal, natural realities, they're standing on top of a mountain and Peter begins to talk. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Before it even subsides, Peter just begins to speak and say, oh, Jesus, do you want us to make three tabernacles here on the top of the mountain, <laughs> one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah? And then a voice comes down from heaven saying, this is my son hear him. Now, this is a small thing. This is just a small point, but it has big implications. I think that, that story communicates by inference that Peter talked way too much. Yes. Because just imagine like, like God himself from heaven decides to start to speak while you're speaking. And what does God say? Hear him. Listen to him. Yeah. And he's interrupting Peter. From yes. God. So it's like, hey, Peter, you shouldn't be speaking right now. Like you've seen something. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Right? That foreshadows the second yeah. coming of Christ where Elijah typifies those who never die, who are translated and Moses typifying those who are resurrected from the dead. And Jesus is showing his divine nature. Like, like divinity is coming through humanity. 
And this is just something that very few humans have ever had the privilege to see. Mm. And then all of a sudden you just start talking. Like, like it's just not, you talk too much, Peter, and you see that throughout the whole course. So Peter's a guy who it's a strength of his because he's, he's brave and he's willing to put himself out there, but it's also a weakness of his. Yes. Where he, he's sometimes too quick to speak, you know, and God himself is like, Hey, Peter, this is my son. You listen to him. He's the son of God. You just saw the divine glory. And all you can do is just the same thing you always do. You just keep talking. Yeah. Why don't you just stop talking a little bit and listen to my son? And maybe if you listen to my son more, you'd be better off. Yeah. You're just so busy talking, Peter. Hmm. You're, not, you're not busy enough listening, you know? So the, here's a man with some very real issues that he really has to deal with. Now that's a, that's a minor issue and compared to some of the others. Are there any other kind of like character flaws or, you know, sinful tendencies that you've seen? Yeah, listen, I can totally see, you know, Peter being this really impulsive man, as you mentioned, and many times, you know, that episode that you, you said, I think it's a brilliant uh, demonstration of that. But, you know, Peter, Peter said, uh, you know, um, you know, he cut the ears of the servant of the high priest, uh, yeah. just had to amend him. And then, you know, when, when he was inquired about if Jesus, um, you know, gave or didn't give taxes for the temple, he said, yeah, for, of course he does. And Jesus comes to him, say, hey, Peter you know let, yeah. let's talk here I, I don't you know that's you no know, there's there's the son of the house pay tithes or pay pay tributes to to his father the king uh you know so many times uh you know peter would say you know when, when jesus is telling them about their 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 uh about his death and, and his sacrifices you know peter says oh far be it from you lord and then Jesus says uh, you know um get behind me satan yeah. You know, because you 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 you're thinking according to the manner of 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 humans of the world, not according to the will of my father. So, so yeah, yeah definitely Peter was big in being impulsive, and speaking too much. But I can see also others. For example, John and James are are called the sons of thunder. And I remember this one episode where Jesus was passing through a village. If I'm you know by by heart, I believe it was a Samaria, and and he wasn't really well received there. And then uh, you know John. You know, probably referring to an episode in the Old Testament uh, with um, Elijah. Uh, he says, you know, God, would you like us to just call fire from heaven to just destroy these people that didn't want to have anything to do with you? Mm -hmm. um, and Jesus says, we do not know, you know, of which spirit you guys are. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, so these like angry, you know, hey, listen, let's. You know, so that's that's one, you know, maybe flaw of character. Simon the Zealot, another of the disciples, you know, he doesn't speak much uh, in the Gospels, but, um, you know, he's a zealot. In other words, he's a terrorist. He's the equivalent to like an ISIS uh, militant today. So being part of being a zealot and, and wanting to kill through acts of militia and terrorism, uh, the Romans for political causes, I think that speaks volumes about some of his character flaws. Oh. Um, you know, you know, yeah. in regards to the whole Sons of Thunder thing with James and John, it's, it's, you know, we read the Bible in church and we read the Bible in our homes and, you know, church is a place where, you know, mostly good behavior happens, right? Like people are singing hymns, they're listening to sermons, they're studying scripture, they're lifting yeah. up virtue and decency and righteousness and uh, grace and mercy and love and all those wonderful attributes of God, right? So that's 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 what's happening in church, is good values are being uplifted, and Jesus Christ is being uplifted. Generally speaking, that's what church is for. Uh, in our homes, we're reading our Bibles, and our homes are usually places of safety and comfort. So you're reading your Bible, and you're reading Jesus, and he's calling James and John his two disciples sons of thunder. And I think sometimes because you're reading that in church and at home, safe, secure places where righteousness is uplifted, you don't really understand exactly what he means when he says that. So you just kind of get a sense like, oh, Jesus calls. You know, maybe it was just kind of a cute little saying. But <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that that's, that's it at all. I think that they come from a pretty rugged uh, Middle, Middle Eastern, Near Eastern context where they live in a very hostile world. That's, that's very violent and very dangerous. And if Jesus, you know, him calling these guys sons of thunder, I think they, they probably were sons of thunder. 
I think they're probably pretty like the kind of guys who, when you see them, like I, I saw this guy at the, at the river this weekend, I was up in Murwillumba and worshiping with the, with the church up there on Sabbath. And on Sunday, mm. a family that I was staying with, they took us to a little watering hole where there's a swing and, and stuff. And there was this yeah. there, man, he, he was a son of thunder. He just, the way he was built, it's like when you see, you see dogs, you see the dogs all the time. And then you see a pit bull. As soon as you see the pit bull, yeah. you just, you're looking at a whole different animal. It's the same animal, but it's a different yeah. kind of animal. You know what I mean? And, uh, and so, you know, this, and then this guy, he's a nice guy, but you could just tell as you're talking to him, he's nice. You try, but he was just, he had just, there were so many indications that just communicate this guy. You don't want to, you don't want to mess with this guy. He's dangerous. Like, if you get in a fight with this guy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's getting hurt really badly or you're getting hurt really badly. There's only two options. If you don't hurt him bad enough to not, yes. you're going to be hurt very bad because he's a son of thunder. Wow. So Jesus is calling these yes. guys sons of thunder. You know, not, it's not like a sweet little, you know, kind of romantic, you know, Hey, you're a son of thunder. These are, I think he would have given them that term because they were, they were thick headed, strong minded, violent guys who come from a violent setting and have a violent past. They're fishermen who fight. They physically fight. They're violent guys, yes. a violent world. Yes. And they're oppressed by Romans and they're probably, you know, on the verge of ready to take up swords themselves and go kill people. So that's right. Context, you know, these are some, that's of a good point, man. That's a good point. Uh, I remember that um, uh, there was one documentary on, on the TV one day talking about the profiles of some, uh prisoners inmates of united states um uh, maximum security prisons and you see these guys with these tattoos and they're just like looking for fights and i think that uh, it will be safe to say that uh these guys that were looking they could be you know rightly be called by jesus like hey sons of thunder yeah. there is a quote there's a quote here that i found in the book acts of the apostles by ellen white uh precisely about that and look how she summarizes what sons of thunder meant in, in um, the life of john she says okay so that's in acts of the apostles page 539 she says the confiding the confiding <clears throat> confiding love and unselfish devotion manifested in the life and character of john present lessons of untold values to the christian church and then she goes on john did not naturally possess the loveliness of character that his later experience revealed no, by nature, he had serious defects. He was not only, and look at this, this, this string line here of, of adjectives here. He was not only proud, self-assertive, and ambitious for honor, but impetuous and resentful under injury. He and his brother were called sons of thunder, evil temper, the desire for revenge, the spirit of criticism were all in the beloved disciple. Uh -huh. And then she goes and says, you know, but, but, you know, the, the Jesus transformed that nature. But like, when you're talking about sons of thunder, we're talking about, you know, imagine like if, if, if you, you know, you're, you're a, you're a father, right? Uh, of, of boys. I'm a father of a girl. Imagine like if, if someone came like, you know, once my girl is, she's only three years old now, but imagine like, you know, 20 years in the future, she comes with a, you know, with a boyfriend home and then, you know, you see, you look at him, she's like, no, that he's a good guy, only that he's proud, self-assertive, ambitious for honor, impetuous, <laughs> resentful under injury. Uh, you know, yeah, he does have an evil temper and a desire for revenge and a bit of a spirit of criticism. But other than that, he's all right. <laughs> you know, I don't know how would you feel, but I said, ah, uh, you know, Katarina, maybe let's pray that God will give you another option. And this is right. what we're calling the sons of thunder. Right. This is the kind of people. Get rid of them. Get rid of them. Hey, yeah, that's so good. Hey, totally. <laughs> you know, it's it's great. So the common denominator amongst the disciples is, you know, th they have issues. They have very big character flaws that they have to deal with. And they're average ordinary guys, but they're converted. And Jesus refines them and develops them. And they become magnificent witnesses for the gospel. and. You know, this this has to teach us, and I, and I think you, before we were talking, mentioned an Ellen White quote to this effect. They they all had to share a specific trait of character, and that would have been a willingness to learn, a teachableness, yes. 
because because that had to be the, the the thing that gave Jesus access to them so that they could change. Because Peter's impetuous, he talks too much and too soon. James and John are sons of thunder. Simon the Zealot is a terrorist. Matthew the tax collector is a comp- traitor, an extortionist, a traitor. I mean, you you got you know you got Thomas and Philip doubtful by nature which is usually due to insecurity and their their tr- or maybe a desire to always be in control and to have to know everything perfectly and so yeah and then they're all tradesmen all of them are tradesmen there is some indications that maybe Judas was the only academic but just common ordinary guys uh yeah. well Matthew too maybe he he had a little education who knows but so the cards are stacked against them but yet still they turn the world upside down. They speak yes. in the book of Acts so profoundly and powerfully yes. that the highly refined and educated religious establishment says, these guys are unlearned and uneducated, but they must have been with, with this guy. They, they, Jesus got yes. his hands on them because look at these guys now. They're pretty exceptional. And that's one thing that, that the, the enemies of Jesus never did is they never... They could never deny the exceptional nature of his work. Um, they just said it came from Satan, not from God. But, you know, so, so they were able to be used anyways in spite, but it's because they were teachable. They were all teachable. Yeah. So I, I, I'm just going to make a point and then give you the last, like, opportunity to share here, Joe, because we're coming to an end. But yeah. the practical lesson that everyone can gain from this conversation that we're having is that if God can do it for Peter, God can do it for me. If Peter can be used by God to preach on Pentecost, then anyone can be. That, that's the, the whole point is, is, is that if Peter, James, John can be apostles, then anyone can be apostles. And Jesus's call to them is a call to us all. And his teaching to them is a teaching to us all. And um, our ordinariness, our plainness, our character issues and tendencies towards sinfulness, like all of this stuff can be taken care of. Jesus can take care of this and still use us to great effect if we're teachable and willing to be corrected and willing to be led. Any thoughts to close? Yes. No, yes, Matt. You know, I my my thought to close this is that in our cultural narrative of the Western world, we we also have that idea that a flawed character can be transformed. Uh, however, in, in our culture's narrative, that can be achieved via uh, education, uh, maybe via love. Uh, perhaps via economic prosperity. And, and, and while all these things are good and well, I believe that you know, still very educated people can be corrupt. Yeah. Still um, very you know, well-loved people can become quite uh, selfish human beings. So what I believe that our culture's narrative lacks is that while it is true that you know having a certain level of education, having certain experiences in life, they will transform our character, particularly on the outside, they are not necessarily going to reform our heart from being a, you know a standard selfish human heart to a transformed um, heart that abides by the value of self-sacrifice. Mm-hmm. So, so maybe so, so, so I believe that this real transformation of heart that will be seen in the outside manners, because you can be very polite and yet your heart can be still quite selfish and quite corrupted. Uh, and it, your politeness is is you know is being demonstrated by um you know because it's 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 helpful you know to you it's it's the right thing to do so my point is that the real transformation of character if 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 you and i if we are longing if god has placed that desire for us to have a renewed character for us to be a better person 
the only person who's actually capable of transforming us from the inside out is the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. Um, and other than that, we can reform our you know manners, but I'm afraid, and I wonder if that it's only sometimes an you know an an outside uh, manifestation without a real transformation of heart. If mm -hmm. we have the same old hearts and yet just different, more polite mannerisms mm -hmm. on the outside. So my my last point is that a real transformation of heart, the the conversion of a heart of stone to a heart of flesh can only be done by a supernatural miraculous power of God. And if you have experienced that, you will know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, and you're listening to that podcast, I would um, encourage you to actually ask God for you to be able to experience that, that the love of Christ and his power will transform um, our heart from a standard human stone made heart to a, heart of flesh transformed by God and recreated by his power. Amen. Yeah, it's so good. Well, listen, thank you guys for, for joining us for all things evangelism in this episode where we addressed how the disciples were ordinary men who became extraordinary disciples. So please, in your own life, don't say things like, I'm just a plumber. I'm just a carpenter. I'm just a tradesman. Don't say those things because the apostles who Jesus chose were just those things too. You should uh, rejoice in the fact that God chooses the foolish things of the world uh, so that he can use them in magnificent ways and make them glorious representatives of the kingdom of heaven. And you have sins in your life? Yeah. So did the sons of Jacob. So did the disciples of Jesus. And Jesus can take care of that. He can, he can, he can, he can train us. He can form us, fashion us, mold us, and give us victory in all the various areas of our lives where we need it. So keep that in mind. Take heart. Take courage. You are God's chosen vessels, His priests, His holy people, and you can be used to witness and to be to become fishers of men. God bless you guys, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care. <laughs>